This could have occurred nowhere but in England, where man and sea interpenetrate, so to speak. The sea entering into the life of most men, and the men knowing something or everything about the sea, in the way of amusement, of treble, or of breadwinning. We were sitting round a mahogany table that reflected the bottle, the claret glasses, and our faces as we leaned on our elbows. There was a director of companies, an accountant, a lawyer, Marlowe, and myself. The director had been a Conway boy. The accountant had served four years at sea. The lawyer, a fine crusted Tory, high churchman, the best of old fellows, the soul of honor, had been chief officer in the P&O service in the good old days when mail boats were square rigged at least on two masts, and used to come down the China Sea before a fair monsoon with stun sails set alow and aloft. We all began in the merchant service. Between the five of us there was the strong bond of the sea, and also the fellowship of the craft, which no amount of enthusiasm for yachting, cruising, and so on can give, since one is only the amusement of life, and the other is life itself. Marlowe told the story, or rather, the chronicle of a voyage. Yes, I have seen a little of the eastern seas. But what I remember best is my first voyage there. You fellows know there are those voyages that seem to ordered for the illustration of life, that might stand for a symbol of existence. You fight, work, sweat, nearly kill yourself, sometimes do kill yourself, trying to accomplish something. And you can't. Not from any fault of yours. You simply can do nothing neither great nor little, not a thing in the world, not even marry an old maid, or get a wretched six hundred ton cargo of coal to its port of destination. It was altogether a memorable affair. It was my first voyage to the east, and my first voyage as second mate. It was also my skipper's first command. You'll admit it was time. He was sixty if a day, a little man with a broad, not very straight back, with bowed shoulders and one leg more bandy than the other. He had that queer twisted about appearance you see so often in men who work in the fields. He had a nutcracker face, chin and nose trying to come together over a sunken mouth, and it was framed in iron-gray fluffy hair that looked like a chin strap of cotton wool sprinkled with coal dust. And he had blue eyes in that old face of his, which were amazingly like a boy's, with that candid expression some quite common men preserved to the end of their days by a rare internal gift of simplicity of heart and rectitude of soul. What induced him to accept me was a wonder, I had come out of a crack Australian clipper, where I had been a third officer, and he seemed to have a prejudice against crack clippers as aristocratic and high-toned. He said to me, You know, in this ship you will have to work. I said I had to work in every ship I had ever been in. Ah, but this is different, and you gentlemen out of them big ships. But there, I dare say you will do. Join tomorrow. I joined tomorrow. It was twenty-two years ago, and I was just twenty. How time passes. It was one of the happiest days of my life. Fancy, second mate for the first time. A really responsible officer. I wouldn't have thrown up my new billet for a fortune. The mate looked me over carefully. He was an old chap, but of another stamp. He had a Roman nose, a snow-white long beard, and his name was Mahon, but he insisted it should be pronounced Mon. He was well-connected, yet there was something wrong with his luck. He had never got on. As to the captain, he had been for years in coasters, then in the Mediterranean, and last 
in the West Indian trade. He had never been round the capes. He could just write a kind of sketchy hand and didn't care for writing at all. Both were thorough good seamen, of course, and between those two old chaps I felt like a small boy between two grandfathers. The ship also was old. Her name was the Judea. Queer name, isn't it? She belonged to a man named Wilmer, Wilcox, some name like that. But he has been bankrupt and dead these twenty years or more, and his name doesn't matter. She had been laid up in Shadwell Basin for ever so long. You may imagine her state. She was all rust, dust, grime, soot aloft, dirt on deck. To me it was like coming out of a palace into a ruined cottage. She was about 400 tons, had a primitive windlass, wooden latches to the doors, not a bit of brass about her, and a big square stern. There was on it, below her name in big letters, a lot of scroll work, with the gilt off, and some sort of coat of arms, with the motto, do or die, underneath. I remember it took my fancy immensely. There was a touch of romance in it, something that made me love the old thing, something that appealed to my youth. We left London in ballast, sand ballast, to load a cargo of coal in a northern port for Bangkok. Bangkok, I thrilled. I had been six years at sea, but I'd only seen Melbourne and Sydney, very good places, charming places in their way, but Bangkok. We worked out of the Thames, under canvas, with a North Sea pilot on board. His name was German, and he dodged all day long about the galley, drying his handkerchief before the stove. Apparently, he never slept. He was a dismal man with a perpetual tear sparkling at the end of his nose, who either had been in trouble, or was in trouble, or expected to be in trouble. Couldn't be happy unless something went wrong. He mistrusted my youth, my common sense, and my seamanship, and made a point of showing it in a hundred little ways. I dare say he was right. It seems to me I knew very little then, and I know not much more now. But I cherish a hate for that German to this day. We were a week working up as far as Yarmouth Roads, and then we got into a gale, the famous October gale of 22 years ago. It was wind, lightning, sleet, snow, and a terrific sea. We were flying light, and you may imagine how bad it was when I tell you we had smashed bulwarks and a flooded deck. On the second night, she shifted her ballast into the lee bow and by that time we had blown off somewhere on the Dogger Bank. There was nothing for it but go below with shovels and try to right her. And there we were, and that vast hold, gloomy like a cavern. The tallow dips stuck and flickering on the beams, the gale howling above, the ship tossing about like mad on her side. There we all were, German, the captain, everyone, hardly able to keep our feet engaged on that gravedigger's work and trying to toss shovelfuls of wet sand up to windward. At every tumble of the ship you could see vaguely in the dim light men falling down with a great flourish of shovels. One of the ship's boys, we had two, impressed by the weirdness of the scene, wept as if his heart would break. We could hear him blubbering somewhere in the shadows. On the third day the gale died out, and by and by a north country tug picked us up. We took sixteen days in all to get from London to the Tyne. When we got into dock we had lost our turn for loading, and they hauled us off to a tier where we remained for a month. Mrs. Beard the captain's name was Beard, came from Colchester to see the old man. She lived on board, 
The crew of runners had left, and there remained only the officers, one boy, and the steward, a mulatto who answered to the name of Abraham. Mrs. Beard was an old woman, with a face all wrinkled and ruddy like a winter apple, and the figure of a young girl. She caught sight of me once, sewing on a button, and insisted on having my shirts to repair. This was something different from the captain's wives I had known on board crack clippers. When I brought her the shirts, she said, And the socks? They want mending, I am sure, and John's, Captain Beard's, things are all in order now. I would be glad of something to do. Bless the old woman. Sartor Resartus and Barnaby's Ride to Kiva I didn't understand much of the first then, but I remember I preferred the soldier to the philosopher at the time, a preference which life has only confirmed. One was a man, and the other was either more or less. However, they are both dead, and Mrs. Beard is dead, in youth, strength, genius, thoughts, achievements, simple hearts, all die, no matter. They loaded us at last. We shipped a crew, eight able seamen, and two boys. We hauled off one evening to the buoys at the dock gates, ready to go out, and with a fair prospect of beginning the voyage next day. Mrs. Beard was to start for home by a late train. When the ship was fast, we went to tea. We sat rather silent through the meal. Mahon, the old couple, and I... I had finished first and slipped away for a smoke, my cabin being in a deck house just against the poop. It was high water, blowing fresh with a drizzle. The double dock gates were opened, and the steam colliers were going in and out in the darkness with their lights burning bright, a great plashing of propellers, rattling of winches, and a lot of hailing on the pierheads. I watched the procession of headlights gliding high and of green lights gliding low in the night, when suddenly a red gleam flashed at me, vanished, came into view again, and remained. The fore end of a steamer loomed up close. I shouted down the cabin, Come up quick! And then heard a startled voice saying afar in the dark, Stop her, sir! A bell jingled. Another voice cried warningly, We are going right into that bark, sir. The answer to this was a gruff all right, and the next thing was a heavy crash as the steamer struck a glancing blow with the bluff of her bow about our fore-rigging. There was a moment of confusion, yelling and running about. Steam roared. Then somebody was heard saying, All clear, sir. Are you all right? asked the gruff voice. I had jumped forward to see the damage and held back. I think so. Easy astern, said the gruff voice. A bell jingled. What steamer is that? screamed Mahon. By that time she was no more to us than a bulky shadow maneuvering a little way off. They shouted at us some name, a woman's name, Miranda Mar or some such thing. This means another month in this beastly hole, said Mahon to me, as we peered with lamps about the splintered bulwarks and broken braces. But where's the captain? We had not heard or seen anything of him all that time. We went aft to look. A doleful voice arose, hailing somewhere in the middle of the deck. Judea ahoy! How the devil did he get there? Hello, we shouted. I am adrift in our boat without oars, he cried. A bladed waterman offered his services, and Mahon struck a bargain with him for half a crown to tow our skipper alongside. But it was Mrs. Beard that came up the ladder first. They had been floating about the dock in that misly cold rain for nearly an hour. I was never so surprised in my life. It appears that when he heard my shout, Come up! He understood at once what was the matter, caught up his wife, ran on deck, and across and down into our boat. 
which was fast to the ladder. Not bad for a 60-year-old. Just imagine that old fellow saving heroically in his arms that old woman, the woman of his life. He set her down on a thwart and was ready to climb back on board when the painter came adrift somehow, and away they went together. Of course, in the confusion, we did not hear him shouting. He looked abashed. She said cheerfully, I suppose it does not matter my losing the train now. No, Jenny, you go below and get warm, he growled. Then to us, a sailor has no business with a wife, I say. There I was, out of the ship. Well, no harm done this time. Let's go and look at what that fool of a steamer smashed. It wasn't much, but it delayed us three weeks. At the end of that time, the captain being engaged with his agents, I carried Mrs. Beard's bag to the railway station and put her all comfy into a third-class carriage. She lowered the window to say, You are a good young man. If you see John, Captain Beard, without his muffler at night, just remind him, for me, to keep his throat well wrapped up. Certainly, Mrs. Beard, I said. You are a good young man. I noticed how attentive you are to John, to Captain. The train pulled out suddenly. I took my cap off to the old woman. I never saw her again, past the bottle. We went to sea next day. When we made that start for Bangkok, we had been already three months out of London. We had expected to be a fortnight or so, at the outside. It was January, and the weather was beautiful the beautiful sunny winter weather that has more charm than in the summertime, because it is unexpected and crisp, and you know it won't, it can't, last long. It's like a windfall, like a godsend, like an unexpected piece of luck. It lasted all down the North Sea, all down Channel and it lasted till we were three hundred miles or so to the westward of the lizards. Then the wind went round to the southwest and began to pipe up. In two days it blew a gale. The Judea, hove to, wallowed on the Atlantic like an old candle box. It blew day after day. It blew with spite, without interval, without mercy, without rest. The world was nothing but an immensity of great foaming waves rushing at us under a sky low enough to touch with the hand and dirty like a smoked ceiling. In the stormy space surrounding us there was as much flying spray as air. Day after day and night after night there was nothing round the ship but the howl of the wind, the tumult of the sea, the noise of water pouring over her deck. There was no rest for her and no rest for us. She tossed, she pitched, she stood on her head, she sat on her tail, she rolled, she groaned, and we had to hold on while on deck and cling to our bunks when below, in a constant effort of body and worry of mind. One night, Mahon spoke through the small window of my berth. It opened right into my very bed, and I was lying there sleepless, in my boots, feeling as though I had not slept for years, and could not if I tried. He said excitedly, You got the sounding rod in here, Marlow? I can't get the pumps to suck. By God, it's no child's play. I gave him the sounding rod and lay down again, trying to think of various things, but I thought only of the pumps. When I came on deck, they were still at it. By the light of the lantern brought on deck to examine the sounding rod, I caught a glimpse of their weary, serious faces. We pumped all the four hours. We pumped all night, all day, all the week. Watch and watch. She was working herself loose and leaked badly, not enough to drown us at once, but enough to kill us with the work at the pumps. And while we pumped, the ship was going from 
us piecemeal. The bulwarks went. The stanchions were torn out. The ventilators smashed. The cabin door burst in. There was not a dry spot in the ship. She was being gutted, bit by bit. The longboat changed, as if by magic, into matchwood, where she stood in her grips. I had lashed her myself and was rather proud of my handiwork, which had withstood so long the malice of the sea. And we pumped, and there was no break in the weather. The sea was white like a sheet of foam, like a cauldron of boiling milk. There was not a break in the clouds, no, not the size of a man's hand. No, not for so much as ten seconds. There was for us no sky, there was for us no stars, no sun, no universe, nothing but angry clouds and an infuriated sea. We pumped, watch, and watch, for dear life, and it seemed to last for months, for years, for all eternity, as though we had been dead and gone to a hell for sailors. We forgot the day of the week, the name of the month, what year it was, and whether we had ever been ashore. The sails blew away, she lay broadside on under a weather cloth. The ocean poured over her, and we did not care. We turned those handles and had the eyes of idiots. As soon as we crawled on deck, I used to take a round turn with a rope about the men, the pumps, and the mainmast, and we turned. We turned incessantly, with the water to our waists, to our necks, over our heads. It was all one. We had forgotten how it felt to be dry. And there was somewhere in me the thought, By Jove, this is the deuce of an adventure, something you read about, and it is my first voyage as second mate, and I am only twenty, and here I am, lasting it out as well as any of these men, and keeping my chaps up to the mark. I was pleased. I would not have given up the experience for worlds. I had moments of exultation. Whenever the old dismantled craft pitched heavily with her counter high in the air, she seemed to me to throw up like an appeal, like a defiance, like a cry to the clouds without mercy, the words written on her stern, Judea, London, do or die. 